Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dream Leapers with Harriet Cole. You know, I pride myself on getting some great guests, and today is no exception. We have a modern day civil rights leader, the first mayor, the very first African American mayor of Montgomery, Alabama. Hard to believe that it took all these years for there to be a first, but he is a deserving first, coming from an incredible family, incredible legacy of public service to his community and beyond. Let me tell you who he is. As I said, the first African-American mayor of Montgomery, Alabama, he is Stephen L. Reed. As an elected official, Stephen Reed's goals for his community have been to increase funding for public schools. He's going to talk about that. And to invest $50 million in Montgomery neighborhoods, community centers, public safety infrastructure, and public transportation. On top of his busy schedule, and he will tell us about that, Mayor Reed has written a book, and this is how we learned so many details about him, titled First Best. And it's all about civil rights and his life, really, uh, that affirms the next generation of Black men and women, as well as others, by showing through story and example their power and potential. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Stephen Reed. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, so well. And congratulations. This is your second term now. Is that right? It is. Uh, we were reelected in August and we're beginning that, that second term here and uh, looking forward to the next four years. Well, congratulations. You know, it's, it's one thing to be uh, elected once, a whole nother thing to be elected again and may it continue and continue. So that that's great news. Thank you, you know, I very first went to Montgomery, Alabama. I live in New York. I'm from Baltimore. I've been all over the place, but hadn't been there. And I had the honor of coming to Montgomery a few years ago to interview attorney Fred Gray. Oh, wow. Who is a living legend who, you know, not as many people as should know his story. Mm -hmm. um, I believe he's about 92 years old at this point, still driving his own car. That's right. <laughs> but uh, why is Fred Gray important to Montgomery, to the nation, and to civil rights? Wow. Well, um, you know, he was one of the people uh, that we referenced in the book, First Best. He has been uh, a great uh, leader and uh, an impactful person uh, in this community for a long time. He's originally from Montgomery and now lives uh, primarily in Tuskegee, Alabama, which is not far from here at all. But he is important, I think, because of the role he played as a lawyer, uh, not only to help Mrs. Rosa Parks, but also Claudette Colvin uh, and Dr. King and many, many others. And he would tell you that, you know, he's had as much joy in the uh, legal wins for those uh, people who uh, history may not remember as much as he did for those that history has remembered. So his courage, I think his commitment to uh, making the law fair for everyone, in particular at, at that time in the mid 50s, for him to be such a young attorney is just significant. I mean, I can't state it uh, any more than, than that. And we were glad to have him uh, write a blurb about the book mm -hmm. and that's featured on the back cover of the book. And we're just you know grateful for his presence and the uh, trails that he's blazed for us. It's incredible. I mean, as you mentioned, he was Rosa Parks attorney. Many people don't know about Claudette Colvin, who was the first woman that we're aware of. She was a teenager at the time, a pregnant and unmarried teen who was the first mm -hmm. to not get out of her seat. And what, what I love about the civil rights movement when we look behind the curtain is there was strategy all around. Oh, yeah. Rosa Parks was put on the front lines for a lot of reasons. I think in part to protect Claudette, but also to protect the movement. If she was seemingly more palatable, say, to uh, the whole of the people looking at the movement that maybe it would work out better. Uh, there was a lot of strategy and a lot of that strategy happened on the ground in Montgomery. I watched you in one of your speeches standing in front of, uh, b behind a podium. And there, there are two different things that Montgomery is called. One is the cradle of the Confederacy, and one is the birthplace of the civil rights movement. You were standing behind a podium that said the cradle of the Confederacy. That was kind of haunting, Mayor. Like, 
on the one hand, here's this powerful young black man and then this symbol. Can we get rid of that symbol? Ideally, um, you know, it, it, it takes an act of the majority of the council to our city council to do just that. But I think that it should be reevaluated, you know, for the most part in our uh, public marketing, we focus on a symbol uh, that started being used as a Corinthian M uh, mm -hmm. with stars around it. And that is really our outward symbol that we utilize. But the official city seal is still that with what you see. Um, and I, I do think that symbols matter. I think symbols are important for us to recognize the message that they sent. And I've advocated not only for that to be changed, but for the names of several streets uh, to be named. And we did rename uh, Jeff Davis uh, Avenue, which was named after Jefferson Davis Avenue, uh, to Fred D. Gray Avenue in my first uh, year, year and a half in office. So we, we were proud to do that. But uh, we felt the time had come, and I'm glad that we, had, we were able to get it done. Um, but certainly, I think with our city seal as well as uh, our uh, city flag, those are things that you know this council I hope will reevaluate to determine whether or not they fit where we are right now. And, and I think that answer to me is they do not. You know, you're you're governing in a place that has firm footing in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the past of our people, including your father, standing up and saying, absolutely not. We have to have a better life for our people. And the past of the Confederacy where people said, absolutely not. <laughs> you all can't have this. And in, in this year, in 2023 and moving forward, you are in this interesting space as a new leader, yeah. you know, of the new South, mm -hmm. you know, doing your best, obviously, to care for everyone, but you know, the, those seeds of the past are still very much alive. Oh, yeah. How do you navigate that when, when you know, there's, there's still overt racism, there's still things that happen that um, are really difficult to accept. And as a leader, you've got to help everybody move toward a better place. How, how do you navigate that? Well, I think that we have to make sure uh, we recognize that the past and how we got here. You know, what does the uh, makeup of this community look like and sound like? Well, it looks and sounds uh, the, like the way it does because of things that have happened in the past. At the same time, you know, from my standpoint, we try to uh, be you know future focused and we try to address those things that are present day. And I think the balance comes from, in particular for me, I, I'm from Montgomery. The last several mayors have not been born and raised here. I'm the... Uh, only one from the you know, public schools to graduate the public schools, certainly in the last 40 plus years. Uh, so I have a little bit more uh, credibility when I speak on things here than maybe some others did. Uh, you know, these aren't things that had to be interpreted to me. These are things that I grew up and I understood as well as learning from the elders, uh, you know, of this community. So we talk about how do we move forward together as a community? How do we focus on the things that bring us together, but how we have to make sure we're addressing the things that have kept us apart and continue to keep us apart. Mm -hmm. And I think in today's national uh, political discussion, uh, that's a lot harder to do. But it's something as a mayor we continue to try to do, uh, but to tell the hard truths when we have to, and if we have to be uncomfortable uh, with change, then we have to be uncomfortable with it. And that's what we try to project. One of the things that I've read in your book that, uh, and, and let me just say, the book is a, an incredible history lesson. Beautifully told stories about you, your family, the country, the con context all along the way. So it really is an incredible history lesson. And I encourage people to read your book because you learn a lot. And what, what is particularly interesting to me is, you know, a lot of people who are interested in civil rights are interest, are paying attention to the past, uh, you know, the history, the all of the things, especially if you look at Montgomery, it's all the things that happened before in your father's generation, right? In your father's generation and before. And he, in fact, was an incredible man who was a trailblazer in Montgomery. Your book shares that, but also it talks about what civil rights looks like now. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's important, Mayor, because many people aren't quite sure what does that mean. I mean, we, we react when 
one after the other after the other of our brothers and sisters are murdered for no good reason, right? We react, we march, we, 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 we react. And what I have read in your book is something that shows some strategy. And so, so what do you think is the strategy needed in order for civil rights to live and grow today? Well, I think that we have to marry the political power that we have uh, with having a, an abundance of black mayors. And I'm the first vice president for the African-American Mayors Association, Mayor Sean Patterson Howard from Mount Vernon, New York, uh, is our organizational president. And we look out and we see the four largest cities uh, in the country with black mayors. Uh, that's significant. It's never happened before uh, in the country's history. And then certainly we see mid-sized cities from the Midwest uh, to the West Coast, to the East Coast and down South that have uh, black mayors as well. So we have, we have attained a level of power that the previous generation did not, but we're still running up against the state driven politics that often flies in, in the face of the um, progress that we would like to make uh, as mayors. And so I think we have to marry the political power with economic power and to make sure that we are consistently um, highlighting things on our agenda that are important to the community. And that we don't let up just because things seem like they're going too good or because things seem like they're going too bad. We have to remain consistent and we have to maintain uh, the challenge uh, and the commitment that is needed in order, in order to meet that challenge as previous generations did. And that's one of the things that we talked about in the first best is how do we lay that blueprint for the Gen Zs and millennials uh, to follow? One is by speaking uh, the you know, unfiltered truth and the other part is by, by sharing our mistakes uh, with them to say, hey, here's some things that you can do that I wish I had known when I was your age, um, that you can maximize using technology, using your platform as an influencer. Here are ways that you can connect uh, and inspire people as opposed to where we are right now. And I think that's what we have to do if we're going to see the progress in this generation that we have seen uh, in previous generations. One of the things that you talk about, and you mentioned a moment ago, is uh, you grew up in the public school system. And something that I think people don't really know about the South, and you describe it in your experience, when you went to school, public schools were integrated. Yeah. That you, you, I think it was junior high that you said. Well, ele elementary all the way through high school. Okay. It was all the way 50, through. 50, 40. Yeah. 50, 50. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. That. So that sort of wipes out one of the many stereotypes that people in the North have about the South, right? That there are all these thoughts that date back before you, but that are believed to be true about younger people. Uh, you had experiences with white students and black students. Were there other ethnic groups where you grew up? Oh, sure. Um, we didn't have the, the large Hispanic population that you see in some of the, the larger uh enclaves, you know, on the coast, but certainly you had that and you had a um, small percentage of, of Asian American uh, students. But one of the things that, you know, I've shared before is, you know, my cousins uh, in Chicago and other parts of, of the Midwest, in particular those in bigger cities, you know, went to more segregated schools at that time than, than we did. So that was probably the, the uh, pinnacle of that uh, effort, uh, or to be honest with you, right now our schools are overwhelmingly segregated. Uh, once again, that's unfortunate because of the impact that it has. But when I was, you know, growing up here, it, it was a uh, great melting pot of, of students uh, in schools that I attended. Yeah. Hey guys, this is Dream Leapers with Harriet Cole, and we are talking to Major Mayor Stephen L. Reed, the first African American mayor of the city of Montgomery, Alabama. He's the 57th mayor of the city. He's just written a book called First Best. It's his story, but it's more than his story. It is the story of civil rights. It's the story of his evolution in Montgomery, Alabama. It's the story of American history in a lot of ways and a, a, a good read if you want to understand civil rights today, civil rights in the past and civil rights today. Mayor, you were in your office when COVID happened. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, the whole world kind of fell apart and is still finding its way back together. Uh, what was what was your biggest challenge during that time in your city to take care of your people when it felt like suddenly everybody had to go home? Yeah, you know, I think um, the biggest challenge was, you know, it had never happened before. And so we were, you know, trying to, you know, it's kind of like fighting an, an invisible enemy. You don't know where it is or, or really how to fight it. But we decided to follow the science and we followed the experts on that and it proved very well for us. While we lost, you know, far too many friends and neighbors, uh, we didn't lose as many as we could have. I think because we were proactive in our approach and because we wanted to be preventive and, and, and measure. So, um, you know, for us, uh, COVID was very unique and something that I wouldn't want any leader to have to deal with, much less uh, those of us who, who came down with it at some point or another to have to deal with it from a health perspective. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we relied on, on the, the medical doctors and the science that we were provided. And for me, you know, I didn't want it to be a political issue. I wanted it to be about the community and what was needed here and what was best for our uh, residents. And that's how we led. And I think that's how we came out of it the way we did. So a lot of people in marginalized communities with lower income, with less savings, you know, just less resources struggled tremendously. You know, a lot of people lost their jobs. It, apart from the health aspect of it, there was an economic crisis that occurred. How was Montgomery affected? How was the black community affected? And what did you do to try to take care of people? Well, listen, the um, community was impacted tremendously. Um, black businesses were hurt uh, disproportionately. Uh, we did not receive the level of financial uh, assistance that was needed. And while we tried to push uh, a number of initiatives and programs out there, it was not enough, mm -hmm. um, ultimately. And so, you know, we're still recovering from that. Uh, and we're still you know, trying to make sure that um, we put guardrails in place so that the next time something, hopefully nothing not near as serious as COVID happens, we have that safety net there for our businesses and for those entrepreneurs that give so much to our community. It truly, truly was, uh, you know, a hard hit. And when you look at it from the health perspective, Again, it was a challenge there. It was a challenge in particular the black community because uh, access to health care is already an impediment to so many uh, you know, low, uh, low income and working class uh, Americans, and certainly those that are in the African-American community. That just made it a lot harder. And it was a, a major challenge, but one, again, that we work with our health care providers, um, our hospitals to try to do everything we could uh, to make sure we reduced whatever barriers uh, that might be there. And I think that along with outside philanthropic support that we received, uh, that we went after in partnerships, really helped us minimize what, what could have been a major, major uh, catastrophe in a scale much larger than it was. Mm -hmm. You made the decision to go into public life somewhat reluctantly. You you grew up, in, in your book describes it beautifully, you know, like riding in the back of the Oldsmobile with your daddy, right? And, and, and going to all of these political events and having your eyes open to what was going on in the world, certainly having respect for it, but that was your daddy's role. That was his lane, right? Yeah. And you decided to uh, try another lane, which was business. Uh, and first tell us about that exploration of, 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 you know, choosing a different lane. What made you make that choice? Like, because you describe it in your book, why did you choose not initially to follow in your father's footsteps? You know, I kind of, I think I put it in, in the book that, you know, I was the other PK, you know, your, your preacher's kid or your politician's kid, mm -hmm. you either love it or you hate it. And I think I was on the, uh, part of, of Haiti and really wanting to, I really wanted to have my own identity and not be, you know, my mom and dad's son, so to speak. Um, and that's why I went to school out of state. That's why I was so heavily involved in sports because none of those things really matter there. Um, but, you know, 
I saw that the sacrifice my parents made, I saw the impact they had on the family. And I think when you're that close to it, sometimes, again, you uh, rebelled against it. And that's what I did initially. And you know, from my standpoint, it was one of those um, areas that I thought that we had capable you know, leaders in, and I didn't think we had a lot in businesses. I tell people this all the time. You know, we didn't have a John H. Johnson here. We didn't have a major luminary at the time that I was growing up. Uh, Dave Bean, you have in Detroit. I was at H.J. Russell in Atlanta um, and, and others that, that stand out in a lot of, you know, areas. We've got a few more now. A few more came after, but there wasn't that corporate presence. And I grew up with an understanding of, you know, money making a difference and a need, you know, for that. Uh, and I just thought that, you know, that, that it, it, there were a lot of people that were in politics that could, you know, bring about substantive change, um, but I was mistaken. Uh, there are a lot of people in politics, but not a lot of people who can bring about substantive change. And I think when I came back to Montgomery after living uh, in, in other cities, I was you know, really frustrated with uh, the lack of progress that we had made. It really was. And I was a little you know, disappointed that you know, the community had not gone any further. And uh, I think between that frustration and sort of the inspiration of President Obama starting to run uh, in 2007, and certainly by the time his campaign kind of hit its stride in 2008, I was looking at public service through a different lens. And I referenced that in first best when President Obama, then Senator Obama, came to uh, Selma to speak at one of the anniversaries for the uh, Selma Montgomery uh, March. And one of the uh, lines of his speech was, there's a poverty of ambition in doing things just for money. And that was something that really hit me uh, in a different way than I think uh, anything else. And that inspiration that I got from his campaign and what it was built on, I, I think really started to show me a different avenue for public uh, service and what could be done through government. Mm -hmm. And doesn't that take you right back to the backseat of your daddy's car? Because your father lived that life. He, yeah. you know, he, t tell us about your father. Well, my dad is, um, 85 years old, so still, still uh, active and uh, very you know, vibrant in, in his approach to, to things, still active politically, though not elected. And, you know, he grew up in segregated Alabama, in rural segregated Alabama, and in poor rural segregated Alabama. So uh, he grew up with not, you know, without having a whole lot and uh, was the Grew up with a single uh, mom, you know, four sisters. He was the youngest of them. And, you know, he was somebody that, you know, really had to fight his way for everything that, that he got. And I think that spirit led him to be a student leader, which is where he met Dr. King uh, during his time as a uh, SGA president at Alabama State University. And that led him to leading the Black Teachers Union at the age of 26. And when you think about the teachers union at that time, you know, that was the road to the middle class. You know, either that or you went to work for the federal government, at least in the South. Now, maybe mm -hmm. if you were in the Midwest and Northeast, you could work at the factories and the plants. But by the teachers, large, were deaf, teachers were bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. Core. Yeah. So he was leading that organization at a time when Again, this is post Brown v. Board when organizations were starting to merge and school systems were merged. A lot of lawsuits, a lot of back and forth that we probably don't appreciate enough or tell enough in our history that really propelled him and kept his activism going. And as he got involved in elected uh, politics and, and grassroots politics, post uh, uh, Voting Rights Act, he really wanted to make sure that there was a difference uh, in the black vote now that we had a chance to go to the polls because he grew up in Alabama at a time when we didn't have that. And I think it's important for, again, the Gen Z's and millennials and even for, you know, the um, our generation, you know, uh, to um, make sure Generation X and others to make sure that um, we understand that it wasn't always there. 
And I think that's something we have to remind ourselves. Just saw some data this morning about apathy in the polls around presidential candidates. Well, you know, we can play that game if we want to and sit it out, but I can tell you, we're gonna pay the we're gonna pay the price more so than anyone else. And whatever however bad it is, it can get worse. Uh, we haven't hit bottom yet. So I think that because of his experience, he was active and was, you know, really committed to bringing about substantive change. And that was something that, you know, not a lot of people really want to do. Most people just want to manage. They don't want to lead. Uh, they want to maintain the status quo as opposed to shake it up. And my father has always been that type of person. And I think, you know, continues to be. But also I know that he is still that in all of us, uh, my brother and sister as well, as well as other family members. So your father, for anybody who doesn't know, is Joe L. Reed. And as an elected official, what, what were his roles? Well, he was um, he was part of the first black city council group that came in Montgomery in 1975. Right. When Montgomery went from a mayor commission form of government uh, to a mayor council form of government. Mm -hmm. Very different gov you know, government. You got districts. Montgomery didn't have that until the, the 70s. Again, when we think about the Voting Rights Act, you know, we, we tend to think of these things as being always there, and they were not. And and they're being threatened at this exact moment. And they are. And I think it's important for us to understand that. So he served as a city councilman for about 20, uh, 28 years or 26 years, something like that. And uh, right here in Montgomery. And, um, you know, he probably made more impact, though, as a leader of the Alabama Democratic Conference, the ADC, which is the Black Political Caucus here in Alabama, with a statewide network. And that's probably been more of the larger impact because through that, he was able to uh, endorse and support Democratic candidates at a time when Dixiecrats in Alabama were turning into uh, Southern Democrats um, with a much different philosophy in embracing uh, the black vote. Mm -hmm. And that was really pivotal in the 70s and 80s, and even into the 90s for that matter. Yeah, um, he, he was a powerful figure in his work life. And it's amazing. It, he's 85 and still doing his thing. And, and I'm sure being an incredible advisor to you. When do you call on him? How, what, what are those times when you pick up the phone and ask for his wisdom? You know, probably when there's a dilemma I have, of, you know, should I, you know, should I choose one option over here or another option over there? And uh, what's the best way? Sometimes it's none of the above. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes he'll say, well, you know, have you thought about this? Have you looked at, you know, this situation? These are the things that you want to consider when you try to make a choice. So um, I call on him for things like that. And, and then sometimes he'll call me and offer unsolicited advice. Uh, when he thinks he needs to as well. <laughs> so there was an incident not too long ago on the barge, right? Uh, in Montgomery, like here's Montgomery again in the news because some knuckleheads start a fight and attack uh, black men on the barge. Can you tell us what happened and how you were able to jump in and, and try to squash the situation and handle it? Yeah, let me, let me tell you this, you know, post George Floyd, I don't know. And post pandemic, I don't know if there's anything you know, that you aren't ready for now as a mayor, uh, if you're a true leader, right? So uh, I've been asked, you know, what was the most, you know, tense time? The most tense time was, in, in my mind, was probably um, the George Floyd incident. Sure. Because that happened in such a short window, right? It went from zero to 100, you know, you know real quick. Versus with COVID, we had a lead up to that. We were able to prepare for COVID. So when you get to the, the riverboat brawl or whatever it's called, yeah. you know, where, where you live, that was something that um, the first thing I thought about was, you know, well, first, you know, were there any weapons used? Did anybody get shot or stabbed? Was anybody seriously hurt? So once we kind of got past those things, I was, you know, I had come down a whole lot by then, right? But I had just left that area probably no more than 30 minutes because not far from there, we were having a back to school event for our public school kids and, and, their, and their parents. Mm -hmm. So when we got the call over the police radio, 
I was like, what is this? What? And I and I really didn't quite, you know, understand the gravity of it because it just seemed like it was a fight that was getting bigger and bigger. So, you know, once we kind of heard that, all right, it got under control and there were no weapons used, I was like, okay, well, on to the next, uh, you know, crisis. And uh, it wasn't until the next day that I saw the video. Mm. And when I saw the video on social media, then I was like, oh, wow. And I called the yeah. police chief then, and I was like, have you seen the video? And he's like, yeah, we got our own. But it was it was our video, the, the cities, which shoots from the dock. So it shoots out into the water, right? So you didn't really see everything that was happening. It wasn't until he saw whatever the world was first, saw, right. You know, from those that were on the boat shooting back towards the dock, you could really see what happened. But essentially, you know, what took place were some, uh, you know, inebriated you know, folks who, you know, impeded a, a, an employee from doing his job and trying to dock a boat, uh, said some things they didn't, they shouldn't have said, and has come out in testimony, uh, regretted, you know, what they did. And that's what started the, the melee or the brawl or whatever it is. And, uh, I think it was a lesson, you know, learned, uh, you know, from a lot of different angles. I certainly think that it took hold for reasons because people were looking for something, uh, particularly in, in, in heavy times like we're living in right now, to say, this is how I feel about things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is what I would like to think I would do. And this is what I would like to think others would do. When confronted, so you had all these analogies, all these metaphors out there, and I think because of that, uh, the incident itself took on you know something that even I didn't imagine after seeing it that first uh, first few times. I mean, it took me literally uh, several times from the young man jumping in the river to others, you know, coming to uh, the aid of, of, of the dock worker to, to really understand that, and I think that's really what we got you know from that but for us it was something i'm glad did not end you know nobody serious. died nobody got badly hurt yeah. exactly hey guys this is dream leapers with harriet cole we are here talking with mayor stephen l reed he's talking about his life about montgomery and he's written a book called first best it's about his life about his journey about his dad about the civil rights movement of yesteryear and today. And there's something that you wrote in your book that I want to, to share with you because it's something that I think can resonate for many of us. You say, uh, you're speaking about George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor. You say, but the, poor, the core of my point stands. As my father said many times, you want to remember that the hottest place in hell was reserved for those who maintained their neutrality in a time of moral crisis. That's powerful. Yeah. Being neutral in a time of moral crisis. So we certainly are living in a time of moral crisis. What advice do you have to folks today as they're living their lives, as they're going through their struggles, whatever those might be, what does it mean to step up and to stand up for what you believe in in these days and times right now? Well, I think it's important uh, because, you know, I talk about this quite often, not only in the book, but also you know, when I'm giving remarks about those ordinary people who change things against extraordinary odds. Uh, they did not have a black mayor. They did not have a black sheriff here in Montgomery County. They did not have a black police chief and judges. And what they were able to do, and not just here, across the country and other uh, uh, movements that, that took place, I think it's nothing sh short than, you know, of a, I don't want to call it a miracle, but it's just something that we should not underestimate. Because in real time, without technology, without uh, the things that we benefit from now, from communicating to the strategy you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. they were able to do these things. And so I think right now, uh, we have to stand up for those things that are important and not worry about cancel culture or, or anything else. And I don't, uh, from my end, you know, I, I view being first up the hill comes with 
uh, opportunity, but it comes with challenge. And you have to embrace both. And you have to make sure that uh, in this role that you're taking a stand on those things that have played people for so long in our city and who look to Montgomery for a symbol. I'll go back to the question you asked earlier about the Riverboat Brawl. I think one takeaway that, that I did get, I, I wasn't quite sure, was that Montgomery is still a outside symbol for a town, uh, for a city our size. Mm -hmm. Because of the past, because of the change that happened here. So people still look to this community different than maybe uh, other cities that are in the South and other cities that may be our size throughout the country. And so I think we have to make sure that we take stands beyond just being the CEO of the city of Montgomery, because I realize uh, that they have, they have a responsibility to do that. I realize that there's a uh, important um, expectation that we have to meet when you sit in this chair as the first black mayor of the birthplace of the civil rights movement. It mm -hmm. comes with a uh, responsibility and I recognize that and I, you know, treasure it. So uh, I think for us to take stands, when we see things happen in politics, when we see things happening on Wall Street, when we see things happening uh, in the Supreme Court and other places, it's important. And even in our own community, we have to make sure we're taking those stands because that's what uh, has gotten us to the progress that we made in so many, many years has been taking those stands, whether they be popular or not. Mm -hmm. You are married and have three children, is that right? Yes. So as a husband and father, and also the leader of your city, what are the what are the values that you think are important, not just for your family, but for the city? You know, you just mentioned Montgomery has a special place in many people's heart and understanding. You know what you you in your book. So this your book is really good. I want people to read your book, and you tell so many. Uh, there's so many lines in there from your mother and your father that live in your head and in your heart, and you're sharing them all the time. What are those lessons that you are sharing with your children that are important for the city of Montgomery and and beyond? Well, I think that, you know, was my mother and my father, given how they uh, grew up and given the uh, era in which they grew up, it's very important to keep things in, in perspective. And I try to do just that. And I try to share that with, with my children and other young people that I may uh, mentor or come in contact with. It is to make sure that, you know, we as a value system for what we do. You can't put a price tag on everything. We cannot make everything about clicks and likes and shares uh, or just about how much we can get paid. We have to make sure that we're making a difference and that we're doing things for the right reasons and that we have a certain conviction about uh, why we're taking on certain battles, why we are taking on certain challenges. And I think it's those things that I take away from my parents that I try to share uh, with young people. And again, I want Gen Zs and millennials to hopefully have this book as a blueprint for how they lead now, how they influence now, not that they have to wait till they are in an executive position or a position of management. They can lead right now from where they are. And I think, you know, the example that my parents always shared with me is to, uh, you know, be who you would want uh, others to be to you, be that to them. That is to help them be that to them as you would want them to be for yourself. Uh, make sure that, you know, we don't compromise our value system and that we appreciate it for all that it is. And I think uh, when I share that with my uh, daughter and sons, they don't always understand it, always appreciate it, probably much like I didn't either at the time. But I think it's something that you hold to instill in them so when they are faced with decisions day in and day out, they can make uh, the right ones more than the wrong ones most of the time. It, it, what's interesting in your book is that you give a lot of examples of lessons. It's not like you just came to be this refined person who's <laughs> sitting, you know, on the throne, so to speak, of, of the role of mayor. But you talk about some challenges you had and people who kind of stepped in to help you see, mm, you know, uh, you got to shape up if you don't shape up. The, the, the outcome is going to be different. What is the importance of mentors for, for success? 
Yeah, I, I don't think one can uh, undervalue mentorship, whether it's formal or informal, uh, whether it's teachers, coaches, uh, you know, faith leaders, uh, in your midst, or neighbors, or, or family and friends. All of those, I think, are important. And, you know, I like to say I'm a composite because it truly does take a village. And you try to take each piece, try to take a piece from somebody you come in contact with to kind of help you improve yourself and to be more self-aware. And, you know, from my standpoint, I think that uh, mentorship is important. Even now I have mentors. So mm -hmm. at my age, at my stage now I have mentors and I hope that as a life learner, I'll continue to have them because they are professionals and they are people that I look up to uh, regardless of their station or class that I say I can learn something from. And I, I find I have wisdom uh, and a level of, of acumen and things that maybe I don't have in certain areas. And so that's important. And I think it's important for us to understand that we can all help someone. Sometimes it's a peer. It doesn't have to be someone younger. Sometimes it's a peer. Sometimes it is someone that's of a different generation. But we can provide that level of mentorship to them uh, that will help them not only where they are, but where they want to be. You talk in the uh, your book really in particular helps to uplift young men, young black men. I think it's for everyone, but in particular, you have emphasis for young men. And you say something when you were growing up, your father talked about wearing the crown and bearing the cross. And there, there, there was a reach that one had to make in order to try to get to the crown, like that, that you all were raised as kings. And how do you reach the crown, but also bearing the cross? Can you describe what that means? Yeah, you know, for us, I, I think that my dad's point was, you know, don't just worry about the glory. Uh, put in the work. Do the work, right? And be willing to um, pay a, a price for the work. So that bearing the cross is really about the work and then the challenge that comes with doing the work, even for those you're trying to help, even for those who, who uh, may not understand. Do the work. And let's uh, make sure that you aren't focused on where you're trying to go so much that you forget about the sacrifice you have to make and the purpose of which uh, you should be doing it. And I think sometimes that can kind of get a little bit out of whack in today's social media environment that we can focus so much on image and appearance uh, that we forget the substance and we forget what truly, truly matters uh, in this space. And I think that's a uh, lesson all of us can learn regardless of, of generation. And so it's fine to, to attain some of the glory, but it cannot and should not come at the sacrifice of the work. And you have to be willing to bear the sacrifice that comes along with that, just as you're willing to wear uh, the glory and the accolades that come along with success. And just to add, not every family, not every black family is saying that their sons are kings. So I love this image of your parents anointing you with the crown, but you have to grow into it and grow up to it. That's a beautiful image of who our young men can be. You as a Morehouse grad, you talk a lot about that. There's so much in this book that is uplifting. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for all that you do for the city of Montgomery and beyond. And and is there a presidential run in in the future? <laughs> I know I'm not the first person to ask, but I couldn't leave without asking you right now. You know what, boy, being being president is, uh, I think, probably the, the one job that's harder than mayor. Uh, I, I think so. Please, I don't know if you can please everybody with that. <laughs> so I, I don't know what, what the future lies. If you had asked me, you know, some years ago, I would have told you I'd be sitting here. So uh, I'll follow God's plan and we'll see where it takes us. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Mayor Stephen L. Reed, congratulations on your book, First Best. Congratulations on all that you're doing. And, you know, we give you all the blessings as you move forward. Thank you. Thank you for having me and really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Hey guys, I told you this was going to be a great interview. Mayor Reed's book, First Best you should read it. You will learn a lot about the past, about civil rights, history, and context in this place that is called the cradle of the Confederacy, but also the birthplace 
of the civil rights movement, where Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, where attorney Fred Gray, who represented her, who represented Dr. King, who represented uh, some of the victims of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Uh, he is 92 years old, I believe, and still practicing law in Tuskegee at this point. There's so much rich, rich history coming out of Montgomery, and a lot of it is captured in his book. But even more important, what is captured is the path forward and the path forward as it relates to people of the mayor's generation and younger people and what we all can do now to make the world a, a better place. So I encourage you to get a copy of his book. Thank you for joining us for Dream Leapers at this special conversation with Mayor Reed. Until next time, have a great day and make it count. Thank you.